I'm Kirk, and I'm going to talk about logistics, everyone's favorite topic. It's a joke, but you don't have to laugh. It's all right. <clears throat> I have two little kids, so dad jokes are part of my repertoire. I am going to talk about a number of different things. First off, I'll talk a little bit about who I am, what's my background, how logistics is something that I can speak about some general concepts and terms as I don't want to assume everyone understands what different words I want to use are and don't want to overwhelm you right in advance. And then the heart of the matter is what can go wrong will go wrong. And there are many, many failure points along the way. So we're going to talk about a lot of different ones that I've experienced through different fulfillment projects and relatively the cost to you as far as time and money or both. And then some ways that you can take proactive steps to help plan against a lot of these things happening. If something is unclear and you want to ask a question midway through, I'm happy if you want to raise your hand. Otherwise, if it's just a general question, we can talk about that at the end. A little bit about myself. I am foremost, I started as a game designer. I'm probably not the best at game design, but I've done it. I published a few games, including two of my own designs, which was Flag Dash, a capture the flag game that Sometimes you may have actually seen it on the Game Crafter website, Tavis you featured that for something as a tutorial in the past. Gearworks was our second title, also I designed that, and our third title was a game I signed actually from another designer in the area in Milwaukee who I met through Protospiels and published his game, Rurik Don of Kiev. I've done some logistics consulting or logistics management for about 25 different projects at this point for different publishers around the world. Some of those publishers are in the US, some are in other countries. And then I also created a pledge manager to help other publishers to more suitably contain their costs post Kickstarter. So that's a little bit about me just in the game space. It's all a hobby, passion project for me. I tried to make a go of it in the past. Didn't really turn out to be a good career move, but it's been something I've done for four or five years now. So a couple of basic terms to start with. One is that logistics as a whole is a wide encompassing topic that includes the movement of things from one place to another. You can generally think of that as your games leaving the factory and making their way all the way to the end customer, whether that be a backer on Kickstarter, a retailer, what have you, even a distribution center that's going to sell to other retailers. Within the concept of logistics, two other large terms you will hear are freight. Generally, freight is more of your bulk movement of goods. That's going to be air, boats, and trucks, sometimes trains, but generally not. And then also a fulfillment is generally going to refer to the concept of an individual recipient receiving whatever they ordered. So that would be shipped from Amazon to their house or from a fulfillment center to their house. That can also still include larger orders, but it's generally going to include more of you buy something at Walmart and it gets shipped to your house. So just so those terms are a little clear. Beyond that, there's also three other concepts then that are more of micro terms that you have a carton. So if you put units within a box, the configuration goes into a carton. Maybe you'd have six of these, maybe three and three, six in a row, etc. And then each carton gets put into a pallet. And a pallet there, I've got a picture you can see here that your typical wood slats that are on the bottom. They can also be other type of materials, but typically wood. And they'll be stacked some number high with different types of cartons on the pallet. Then they can use the lift to grab those pallets and move them where they need to go. And finally, a container would be what they put onto a ship or often a 53-foot truck functions as a de facto container, but that's a, generally a steel large box that you can hide in. I mean, you can put different products in. Generally, you'd load the pallets into the container. So those are some general terms. Don't be afraid of those things. They're just items to know about. There are eight or seven different topics I'm going to talk about in regards to different areas where things can go wrong. I'd like to add a general disclaimer that not all of these things will go wrong. You might get really fortuitous and have very few of these things go wrong. And for most of you, if you're not looking to self-publish a game, hopefully you don't have to worry about a lot of these things. But if you ever did decide you wanted to self-publish or you worked in with a publisher, or even if you're not, there are still a number of things you can do to help minimize these potential frustration points to yourself, to the publisher, to the end customer, and they come in all sorts of flavors. So these categories generally are on the planning side. And one more caveat I should say is that what I've grouped these up are, 
I tried to assign the most blame where possible, but it doesn't mean that it's always on that side. So when I talk about the planning errors, that generally means that you are the person who's responsible for coming up with the overall logistics plan, probably had an opportunity to do something to reduce those issues. When I talk about manufacturing, it means that there's a chance that the manufacturer messed something up on their end, but again, it, it could have been your fault because you didn't give the proper specifications. Same thing on freight, it may be the freight liner's fault, but it could have been someone else's fault, but I generally try to bucket them at which part of the process or the partner you're going to work with the most that could probably be most responsible for it. And again, you're probably the one that could have been responsible in a lot of cases, but these are the functional categories. So the different planning areas, administration and communication, the manufacturing, freight, fulfillment, import tax, that's where you'll hear the term VAT, V-A-T, come into play, and then things related to your backers or your end customers. So we'll first talk about planning here. Now I've got a little legend on the bottom left is that I have different icons to indicate the severity. I would say these are based on my experience with a lot of different projects, the general severity of time and money impact if these things go wrong. So I've got three different money related ones. There's a coin one for something that's probably less than $200. The dollars are probably less than $1,000. And then the bank is going to be something that's gonna cost you over a grand. Now magnitude of scale does apply here. So if you make a massive hit like a Gloomhaven or a Scythe, all those numbers are going to be large. If you make something where you're only sending a thousand units around the world, these numbers are probably in line and then do the math in between there. Then for the time legend, there are just a stopwatch, something that could take hours of your time to remediate. Days would be that single calendar entry or the weeks would be that bottom one. So just to give you a general sense of if you could only focus your time on certain areas to try to remediate or avoid issues, you probably want to avoid the ones that have the larger impact to you. And as you all know, time is money. So I'd actually say that the ones that have days or weeks are probably your most frustrating and annoying things. Even if something else would have cost you thousand dollars, you may have rather had your week back. So generally about planning, the biggest issue that most people do if they would have an issue in their fulfillment is that they chose to undercharge shipping to their customers. Now I could throw out a lot of project names that have done this, but some of you might already be familiar with some of those projects. The most typical example of this would be that someone did not account for one or many variables along the way. We'll talk later about some of the best practices you can do to help avoid missing out on different categories. For example, you might forget that there is going to be an upcoming increase in the prices because you got quotes today in 2019, but you're not fulfilling, fulfilling until summer 2020. So you may have overlooked the fact that there was going to be some sort of price increase. This can be rather substantial. Even a single dollar more that you underestimated shipping on a backer with our 1,000 customer example, that's gonna cost you $1,000. It very well could be more than that to you. And this could be all over the place for the reasons why, but it's just generally that it is so important to plan properly. And we'll talk about some ways you can do that better. Another thing to keep in mind is that people don't always think about the concept of dimensional weight. This is another topic that sometimes gets overlooked or is misunderstood. So for example here, the closer you have to a, an absolute square, let's just say that something is one inch by one inch by one inch, like a cube, it's really simple to calculate shipping if you have a box that is proportionate to that because all the sides are equal, but that's generally not the way things are. As you can see here, this dimension here, this length is longer than the height, which is longer than the width. This gets blown out of proportion when you factor in different size games. So if any of you have seen a really long and narrow game box, there's a good chance that when it ships, it doesn't ship for its actual weight. What it actually would ship for is using a formula to go based on the fact that its proportions indicate it should cost you more. What this can often do is balloon your shipping from something that would have been maybe a two pound item to something up to six or even eight pounds is the shipping price, which is rather substantial. Case in point with this, we had this game we produced along with the play mat, which if I go back a few slides, we had put this play mat within a, a box. Now you can see the relative ratio of that play mat box that was a, an individual item and this, the play mat box is much longer. So when we wanted to ship these together, collectively the play mat box went from about here to here and then this game had to kind of sit on top of it. What happened there is that this game in the playmat by itself should have shipped for something around 
three pounds, but it ballooned the shipping price to something like six or seven pounds, depending on the shipping partner. And if I would have just gone to the post office myself, it would have been something in the eight to 10 pound mark. But by using certain freight partners, they have discounted rates. So it's something you can easily not think about that is your configuration within how something's going to be shipped. So if you again have something that's more normal proportions and items, you're gonna be good. But if you start to ship play mats, and we'll talk more about that in particular, that is where you get into all sorts of problems. Another thing that this one is difficult to figure out until you've been in it a lot is to underutilize container space. So again, the container is the metal, steel, big box that's generally 20 foot or 40 foot and it's going to contain a lot of different individual units and basically there are some tools online that can help you estimate this but you could even just go in excel and make all your rows and columns the relative width and height that are the same and you can try to chart it out there if you really want to or use some formulas but basically if you are to tell your partners at any point that you need something done a certain way they might just do it without taking their best judgment into effect. And what I mean by that is, if you can picture that this width is the entirety of a container, and you tell them, now this wouldn't just be games, but assume these are pallets. If you tell them just to line up three pallets here side by side, and you didn't use this space, that's a lot of dead space there. And there's a chance that you could have suggested at some point to the manufacturer, hey, these are gonna be our containers we're going to ship in, can you help me understand the best way to fill the space? And maybe they could have done something where they rotated something and be able to make more space that you can avoid just paying for air in the shipment. Hopefully that makes sense. Two other quick things that don't cost you as much money, but they are something people overthink is related to two countries in particular, or rather continent with Canada and Australia, is that people often, and if you're from those Places I do apologize, I'm not trying to make light of that, but the general percentage of people who back from those regions is rather low. If you had 1,000 people who backed again, you're only going to have 30 people from Australia that back, and you might have 50 people from Canada who back. So if you think about that on a large scale, if you overemphasize too much on those, you might end up losing money by sending too much stock, anticipating that you're gonna sell more, and so you just have wasted games and you pay for more shipping. And then the flip side is that uh, you underestimate it it's not actually that big of a deal to send a couple more units to make up the gap later. Another thing is that you can end up having issues related to not having enough games in foreign regions to cover replacements and damages, such as in oddball countries like Israel or South Africa or places where it's really hard to get games to. I'm gonna to switch topics here. So this is related to just general administration and communication items. This spans a very long period of time and the buck falls back on you in most of these cases. Even if your partners are having some communication challenges, ultimately you gotta be a good project manager and be on the back of people that you're trying to work with. I'd say that in the, the nicest way possible, but you just have to keep the communication lines open. So one of the biggest areas is that you just don't know what you don't know and you don't ask good questions. Now I listed it as just simply hours is that you might go off making wrong assumptions about something only to come back. A good example of this would be that you assume that there are no extra charges for adding on certain services that you want just because someone told you that this is usually included. Also making wrong assumptions is really bad. Now these could compound themselves other places but it's just a general thing is that you wanna be asking great questions. Now if you're working with other companies, and when I say other companies, just to make it clear who these might be, your manufacturer, whether that's Panda or in the US Game Crafter or any other manufacturer, a freight company would be someone like an OTX or a Green Worldwide or someone that would manage the boats going from port to port. And a fulfillment company might be Amazon Fulfillment Services, Quartermaster Logistics. Those are generally the types of companies you're working with for partners when I refer to partners. So if you have any companies you're working with that are unreliable, and getting back to you quickly, well, that should be a, a good red flag to you. But there are, unfortunately, some countries that their vacation schedules don't align with what country you might live in, for example, if you're in the United States. So you, I wouldn't take it personally, but you just have to understand that what is reliable in their country or region and figure out what norms are there. But if you have unreliable communications, that can cause you to lose a lot of days, usually. If you're not staying up till 2 a.m. in the morning like I usually do, you might end up having a one email, one email back and forth in a single day with a partner in China. If you stay up late enough at night, you can end up bridging that gap and getting a couple rounds of communication, but that's just something to keep in mind. 
The other thing that always surprises people that haven't worked on game projects before is what you would expect as far as holidays go is different. So for example, Chinese New Year is something that basically shuts down China for the entire month of February. But it's not just February, then there's a lead up until the end of January to finish projects before then. So for lack of a better way to say it, you lose almost two months of productivity in China if you weren't already queued up to finish before the end of January. Same is true at first week in October. And then there's also some rotating holidays in Europe where people get to take two weeks off because they have a lot more vacation there than we do. And your partner might happen to be one that's off for two weeks at your most critical juncture. Other things are that you often will find that your emails from foreign partners go to spam because they use domain names that are not received well by your emails. I've had this even happen where I've emailed a foreign partner upwards of 100 times and then all of a sudden my email provider decides to flag them as spam and I wonder why they're not responding for a week. I find they email me three times in spam. So when working with international companies, you probably would do well to check your spam email at least once a day looking for their emails because, again, these time issues, you will be really frustrated with yourself that you didn't catch that and create a rule for them. But then again, also, sometimes they will have email domain problems, so they might email you from another domain that you couldn't have planned on that anyways because they were trying to circumvent other server issues they've had. So again, when you're working across multiple regions and countries and you have different IP restrictions and different network configuration, it can be a frustrating process looking for spam emails. This one at the top is probably the most annoying problem you can have. And so I would encourage you whenever possible to eliminate middlemen companies if you can. And what I mean by that is that if you book freight with your factory, there's a good chance they're not managing it all the way through. And my first project we did, I booked freight with the factory who booked freight with a Chinese partner that worked with an American partner. There were three different touch points along the way where everyone didn't know what had already been done and I got contacted and it was like, hey, the goods are where they are right now and I need something to get this shipped in the next 30 minutes. Can you help me? That was the most frustrating experience you could imagine. What you would hopefully do is find partners and you say, are you going to be managing this from start to finish for me or as many of the steps as possible so that you don't have to rely on talking to all the different people along the way? Another thing is that forms not filed on time, just like if you don't submit something when you need to submit it at work, there are severe penalties financially. There is a particular form that has to be filed prior to a boat leaving the port in China or anywhere else, 48 hours prior to it leaving the port. If it's not filed, your fine can be upwards of $3,000 regardless of the product value, and it can go up from there. That generally is on your partner, but if you reach out last minute, don't give them information in a timely fashion. Technically, it could be your problem. Also, if the forms are filled incorrectly, a good example of this would be if you may know that tariffs are a big topic now in the U.S., but they have been around the world for a long time. If your goods are classified wrong, you may pay a lot more than you were expecting to pay. Up until right now, there currently are no tariffs on board game products in the U.S., but there are different types of other accessories in the game industry. I've worked with a couple publishers that we didn't catch it until late that a couple of the numbers were off different in the harmonized tariff system, the HTS codes, or sometimes just referred to as HS codes. In that case, thankfully, it was actually a relatively small amount since it was a small shipment, but nonetheless, it was money they wouldn't have had to pay. They, they had paid it. We had to go get a refund. It's just a bit of a headache. Sometimes it could be harder to get the money back if you're working with certain countries. This last one here at the bottom, Make sure that you get insurance on your cargo. The percentage that you pay is nothing. I have a shipment that was worth over $20,000 that came to the U.S. My insurance cost me something in the ballpark of $200 for it. It's a no-brainer to pay for this. If something happens, though, and you don't have insurance, you could be looking at a complete loss of all your inventory that came over, and you won't be able to get back a penny from that. So make sure you pay for insurance. And a lot of freight partners won't assume that you want to pay for it because it's unlikely that those damages happen. So that's something that's on you to ask good questions and make sure that you sign up for that. Any questions at the moment here before we jump into a different category of potential issues? There's a lot of variables, so there's just a ton of information here. I'm just trying to help you understand the, the general scope of how large the potential for issues can be. 
At the manufacturing side, I would say that the majority of the issues are not manufacturing issues, but the areas in which manufacturing can have issues that impact your fulfillment and your logistics are if there are different magnitudes of scale of production defects. This depends on your manufacturer, generally something around 1% would be considered acceptable, or I would categorize it as that minor production defects. When you think of a production defect though, that might mean that a single game is missing a single piece. That isn't truly reflective of everything. You might have it all over the place that this one game has missing one card in there. This other game happens to have two of the same thing. It can be all over the place. Those minor ones, you're just gonna ship replacement pieces to the people that ask for things. But when you have something like a, what I would call a gross production defect, which some games straight up just don't package an entire component, so 100% of the games are wrong, that's what I'm talking about here, and you could lose five to $10,000 really quickly because if you don't catch it soon enough, you will end up shipping replacements to every single person who backed the game. So if you think about even the cheapest possible shipment you could do to a friend if you're mailing them not a postcard, you're mailing at least a dollar to mail it to them, so even if even if it was just one or two cards and you're only mailing it within the US and you have a thousand people, that's at least a thousand dollars, but it's more than likely that the items are not just a couple cards and it might cost you three to $10 per person around the world to mail them the replacements. So the big takeaway there is at every step along the way, review the entirety of the package, make sure nothing is missing, make sure everything lines up with your checklist of what you would expect. This is probably one of the most expensive mistakes that could be made the factory is probably unlikely to share much of that cost with you because ultimately you should have been checking that. The other thing is that weak game boxes, and I put this as manufacturing, technically it's on you though, but the manufacturer, if they're a good partner, should hopefully be advising, hey, I think you're probably not making your games as sturdy as they could be. I don't know if any of you have a non-game box with you. Maybe you have an Amazon shipping box, or if you can picture that, if you were to push on the lid for that, you know, like that's a good example, or a shoe box, those are pretty weak boxes. You don't see boxes like that used for a game box. If you think about your old school Monopoly life, those are pretty weak game boxes, but if you think about something uh, like a ticket to ride or anything, you can just think about the, the boxes are sturdier, and generally there are certain tolerances that are better than others. If you don't make your boxes thick enough, you make it easier for shipping damages to occur. So it's just something to keep in mind that when, if you were to produce a game yourself, you would be asking to pay for not the cheapest thinnest box you can pay. Ballpark of anything over one millimeter is your starting point, and you generally would look more like the 1.5 millimeter mark minimum. Um, I'm saying that wrong, one millimeter is too, thick, uh, too thin. You're gonna look at like the two millimeter and up. So there's not many issues related to manufacturing because usually that's a separate ball game for things you've done wrong there. Now freight, so this is things generally gonna be on a boat. So a couple of these here are difficult to figure out if you've not done it before, and this is where you're hopefully relying on good partners asking good questions about what you should do for this. So similar to game boxes being weak, you could have the shipping carton. So that's again, if you have six games in a box, it's your carton. If the carton is weak, it doesn't matter how strong the game is inside. If the carton gets damaged, then the games are probably gonna get damaged. Your fulfillment centers are not gonna pay attention closely to damage on every single game, especially not Amazon and your customers are gonna ask for replacements. So you generally don't wanna pay for cheap cartons. What this often means though is paying more for the cartons. This would actually be at a factory level that you would say, hey, I'd like to pay for thicker cartons or ask them how thick they are to begin with. Generally, you want double ply cardboard. So if you know what a ply is, if you can think about kind of a little wavy pattern. So you've got, it's like a burger almost. There's a layer and a layer with a wavy pattern in the middle. That's a single ply. So if you look at the side of a shipping box ever, Double ply would be you've got layer, wavy, layer, wavy, layer. So it's kind of got two levels of crunch impact. So if something were to hit it, this wavy part gives you a little bit of play within the box. Another thing is if pallets are too tall, then you'll start to have damages at the bottom of the pallet. I've had this before where I ship things. Now this is compounded by weak shipping cartons. If you have too many cartons on top of one another, then the bottom ones have damages. I would still say after learning from a lot of times, it actually still is sometimes more advantageous to fill your cart, your um, container optimally to go taller and risk damages on the bottom level so you don't have to pay for a second container to boat. So it's all big formula. You try to look at what's, if I am likely to have 20% of my games on the bottom that have crushed damage, 
but I can avoid paying for a second container, which is over $3,000, then all of a sudden it's probably still worth it to me. It's a big spreadsheet game. Another thing is that pallets being stacked is another issue, and this is actually potentially very disastrous that can be compounded by the fact if you have weak shipping cartons. I did list a small cost on there because it, it in large scale doesn't matter as much as other things, but for the backers that get it, it can be really frustrating, and it can be really frustrating to find this out last minute and you have to figure out how to pay for replacements. But if you have a pallet on top of a pallet, that's a lot of weight, often in the ballpark of 700 kilograms on top of another one, and it could have a lot of damages. So oftentimes your freight partners will just generally assume that your products are packaged securely for anything to be stacked upon them up until the top of the container. That's a bad assumption for board games because people actually prioritize the game boxes. But when you're opening something like a, uh, maybe I can think of another example here, uh, any home goods, maybe you're trying to get some sort of cleaning supplies, at the end of the day, you're not keeping that box. So if the insides are fine, and that there's also other things like if you're shipping books, those are pretty dense, but board games are not 100% dense. So pallets stacked on top of each other is generally something you don't want. So you have to play in the balance between having the pallets be too tall, but also not making them too short that they're going to be stacked on by other ones. Again, if you have a good partner that can help you with this, there's some generally good things to keep in mind. 1.3 meters tall is generally pretty safe across the board for any pallets to be too tall. Anything above 1.7 meters tall is generally going to be asking for trouble unless you have a really, really sturdy setup. Somewhere in between there is where you'll land. And it all depends on how high your carton is. So for example, I have here this game box. The way this one shipped in a carton was that they were all on its side. So that meant that the height of this was a little bit lower than this, a little bit taller than this. So you have to multiply how many times that is stacked. So if it's a really tall width, that means you have less flexibility of how many layers of cartons you can put on a pallet. It's a big Jenga exercise. Another thing to keep in mind, and this can be very pricey, I learned this the hard way in the past, but I've done better in recent times, is that if you are splitting inventory from one point along the way, if you don't prepare them for later split shipments, you can incur a lot of charges at the warehouse to have their staff go in and identify the products, repackage them, and put them differently. So what you would generally be able to do well is if you ask your factory to split. So let's just say you have two products to make it simple. Let's say we have game A, game B, and you know that you don't have an even distribution of games that are going to your different fulfillment centers, you would do well to, and this is a good example within Europe, if something comes in, you're generally going to send it to one port and then you're gonna to wanna to split it from there. And this is where I refer to logistics often as being a pick up and deliver game because it does conceptually function as that when you think about it hitting places on a map and going places. Now there's a lot of calculations behind the scenes, but if it's going to land at Hamburg in Germany and you wanna end up sending things down to both Great Britain and to your German partner at Essen and you wanna send it also to Poland and you'd have different splits, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship for your products, and you don't have your pallets labeled going to Poland, going to German, going to Great Britain, then their warehouse staff have to go in. They have no idea what they're looking at just because even the person you communicate with is not going to be the person opening it. They're going to have to open things, identify what they are, keep going back and forth with your list, move things around, make them into new pallets, and send them, and you're in the ballpark of 500 to to $1,000 more in cost to get that all split, and you could have saved yourself and that's just per shipment that landed somewhere. So you would want to be thinking three steps ahead at the factory and the freight level. Now this bottom one is probably the worst case scenario. The ship could be destroyed. Thankfully, that's the only thing on all these slides that I've not had happen to me, but I did have the damaged or the, the damaged in there. I have had a ship be damaged that I was working the product. And what happened to the shipment for a week? It was, they had taken into a port, switched ships to another one, and you didn't know if there were any damages at that point. I've also had containers be damaged. And you just can't control these things. And good luck ever getting back the money. Even if you have insurance, you will get back something. But So I, I don't want to make it sound like you get nothing back. But it's just a very long, drawn-out process. So it's just frustrating all around. You cannot control that. That's the one thing you can't control. Other things for freight. Freight. This top one can cost you anywhere from three to five business days is that if you have a missed deadline to load the container, which is separate from loading the ship. So you can almost think about it as that you had a two-part process that things have to get preloaded before they get loaded. This often comes down to the factory promising a date that they can't meet. 
and then you've worked with your freight partner to give the date that they can't meet when in fact you would have done well to connect the factory and the freight partner so they can have daily communication to understand better since generally freight liners book a week out week to 10 days out and if you miss the one if they try to rebook you it's generally the fastest going to be five days later it depends on the shipping line but a lot of times in recent times what they're doing is working the available supply and demand of shipments and they are blanking boats and when they're, they're saying is eh, we'll just skip that boat sailing i'm not making this up and we'll wait to the next boat so you might end up even having to wait 10 or more business days to get on the next boat if you miss it similar to missing your plane it's the same type of concept there cargo rates change on the first and the 15th of each month so you generally have two things to keep in mind here your logistics partner might be promising you rates being willing to eat the plus or the minus that happens between when you got the freight quoted and when it actually sailed in all likelihood the rates are going to change by the time that happens and if it's the first time you're doing it you'll be rather frustrated because it's almost always up but they'll say that that's just normal and it's on you so you just need to know that that if you get quoted and you are always getting them quoted more than two weeks in advance of it being shipped you just have to understand that you're going to have swings and confirm the price two weeks prior and that's just the way it is. But you just have to, and we'll talk about it later, account for swings in these prices, not take the price as what it is. If you work with a large enough partner, and I will add an asterisk, they can guarantee prices because they have prepaid ships that they will sail on. So for example, it's almost as if you paid for an all-you-can-eat buffet on a college campus for 21 meals every week and you get a discounted price because you chose to pay for 21 meals, but how many of you would have actually eaten 21 meals in the cafeteria each week? I know I did not. The same is true with some of those that they're taking on the risk that they're actually sailing that really high number of ships. So some partners, if they're large enough, can promise you them those rates and they won't change, but if that's true, those larger partners often um, are hedging on their bets to you too, so you might still be paying more. It's just a guarantee they price lock it, but you still might be paying more than paying the actual that fluctuates. There's also issues related to optimal shipping lanes, both water and land. So uh, let's do a little participation here. What ports are there in the United States and which ones are the most common ports for goods to come in from China? Does anyone know? Mike, you can't answer. Long Beach, or what about Seattle? Long Beach is one of the most popular ones in California. It's one of the fastest end times. Seattle? Seattle's another one. I'm not aware of San Francisco being a common one. That doesn't mean there isn't one. Yeah. Detroit is one of the most common ports for imports. Tell me how that one makes sense. Same thing with Chicago. You've got a lot in Florida and then some in New York. So what ends up happening, though, is that they don't actually hit that port to start with, but there's a port at Detroit. There's a port at Chicago, and they don't discharge the goods to your end trucker until the end port. So what ends up happening, if you think about it, it's still going to hit the coast somewhere, and then it's still going to go from a boat to a truck or a train and then going to go from somewhere else and so if you can think about just generally maximizing your routes and again pick up and deliver game here there are some ways you can optimize where things go from point a to point b to point c especially when you have splits along the way so if something's coming to your house or your garage to fulfill it all your friends and family and you're also sending something to an amazon warehouse you might have to figure out a good middle ground for where to split it based on if more is going here or there a good freight partner will help you look at that but I would push back and ask for alternate shipping patterns. There is also similar to flights, that if you think about the concept of you could fly to Orlando direct from Madison, direct from Milwaukee, but if you chose to instead take a leg through Minneapolis or Denver or Detroit, you might actually end up cheaper. The same thing is true. It's all about capacity. So sometimes even the longer paths will still be cheaper depending on use, usage and utilization. So if your freight partner can requote those as close as possible sometimes they'll be agile enough to push you into an underutilized shipping lane this last one was a fun one that i misunderstood in the past year which was a little frustrating i think of china as being china east coast because most of the factories i've worked with are all on the east coast really bad assumption as you may know china has the equivalent of 13 i think 11 or 13 time zones worth of land it's one time zone but if you think about how wide that is and the factory i worked with was about seven time zones it's again, they still had the same time, but about seven time zones west from the east coast. So if you think about the trucking rates from there to the port on eastern China, it was a lot more than I was expecting. And then I had to go back to some partners that I produced with and say, oh yeah, I didn't catch this, so we all get a share of the bill for this, and they were not very happy about that. So 
figuring out the factory location in advance is a big deal. Again, that comes back to making a mistake on making wrong assumptions. Questions on freight before we move to the next topic? Okay, so fulfillment, some of these play on same levels to the freight, but they, I would say the responsibility is a little bit different. And the responsibility starts to shift to be more on your end fulfillment partner. Again, fulfillment means one person buys whatever they bought, two games, one game, compared to these bulk shipments. If there's too many games in a carton, the main downside there, so this game came in cartons of six games in a carton, which is pretty normal. But if you have a tiny game, so for example, if you were to buy, let's say Hanabi, if you're familiar with that game, or something like Ku, that's a really tiny box, there's gonna be way more than six in the case. It's probably 24 or more. But there's a certain critical mass that if they're too large, and this is a, a small cost, if you're trying to sell to retailers, how many do you think they're gonna buy of your game? If a carton is too many for their typical order volume, then there is still a processing step that your fulfillment warehouse has to go break up the cartons and send them. So you add extra administrative costs, probably in the ballpark of $35 an hour for their time to split those apart and remail them. If you instead had your carton such that your carton equaled the typical number you would expect a retailer to buy, so a typical number would be in the ballpark of, depending on your game size, four to 12, then it's much simpler that they can just take this shipping box that has the games in it, slap a label on it, and mail it on to your retailer. And if you've paid for good shipping cartons, then generally it's gonna work out well for you. Insufficient packing materials, I did list that as a smaller dollar amount because it's really just gonna end up being a small dollar cost to replace because there are elitist gamers who will ask for their tiny ding in the corner of their box to be replaced, but by and large, most people are reasonable and will not ask for you to replace something for minor box damage. However, your perception for your brand and you does take a hit if there is insufficient packaging material. So even though the ultimate dollar cost is low to you, you have to think about what you want your brand perception to be. We've chosen in all of our games to go overboard with packing materials. And generally we've received a lot of very, very positive comments from our backers saying something like, these are the best pack games we've ever received, yada, yada. And we spent more money, more time on it, but that positive brand awareness can be a really big differentiator. At the exact same time our latest game shipped, this thing weighs six pounds, it's rather large. The potential for damage was huge. Worldwide, shipping 4,000 copies, we've only had two boxes reported as being damaged. That's ridiculous, ridiculously good. At the same time, there was another larger Kickstarter that shipped around the world and their shipping materials were terrible and they got lambasted for having really bad shipping materials. People love that game. It's actually still rated higher than this game as far as gameplay goes, but the company had a negative image from that. So at the end of the day, you can control what you can control. I do think there's value in having a really positive brand image. Weak mailing boxes are another flavor of the same. Same thing as working with the factory, you should work with your fulfillment partners and ask them how many plies their shipping boxes are. Again, ply is the layer, swiggle, layer. You're gonna want the two ply shipping boxes there again. These don't cost that much. A custom mailing box, if they don't have it in supply, might cost you 25 to 75 cents per shipment. If you think about that, compared to what you would estimate the potential damages to be with backers to replace them, it's generally worth it if, it's a, if they're gonna have weak boxes to begin with. Amazon always has weak ship boxing, shipping boxes. They will not give you custom boxes if you work with Amazon. So you need to instead have pre-mailer wrapped boxes or do double bubble wrap layers, which is what we did for Rurik. So what I mean by those two options is you could take a rather tightly fitted box that you would have your factory make to wrap around this game that might have some sort of thin packaging material which adds another layer so that if Amazon fulfills it, when the Amazon box shows up destroyed, which it always does at my house, maybe it's my mailman, but it always shows up destroyed, then the inside box protects your game. The other level is that you choose to take, and I say you want to do two levels of your typical bubble wrap around a game. At the factory level, it costs us 30 cents per game to put that on there, but then you've got your shipping material, or your fulfillment packaging materials already in place, which does actually save you cost at the fulfillment center because they don't have to put what are called fill materials, whether that's your foam or your packing peanuts or your packing paper. If you've already pre-wrapped a game, then you're gonna save some costs. Not all of them will, but a lot of them will give you a discount. It offsets some of that. This bottom one here can be really annoying if you have multiple freight shipments coming to the same place. So this would be if you chose to order 
promotional material such as dice towers that you would make in very small quantities or maybe metal coins or something that you're not using your primary factory for these and you chose to ship them separately and they arrive at different times, you're faced with a big decision. Do I hold up the entirety of my games to do fulfillment, make my backers upset that I'm shipping three or four weeks later, or do I in advance ship the majority of the items and reship items later? So that's why I listed it's like a both or an either, or you might spend a fortune, and when I say a fortune, you might spend three to $5,000 to reship these other items separately, or you might end up delaying your project by weeks, and you have to weigh that out. So depending on where you're at, you might do a little bit of a split approach. It depends on which countries too. If it's a small country or region, you might just bite the bullet and ship separately. And I've seen a lot of projects choose to take something. If they were six to 12 months late on their project, they'll pay the three to $5,000 to not avoid another month delay to avoid safe face publicly. So it is pretty large. So the other way you can avoid this is at the factory level, you can ask a factor to accept a shipment from another factory. They put the same shipment together and send it on. You could still the same delay. It just happens on the front end and doesn't feel as pressing when it happens earlier in the pipeline. Other things, and a lot of these are things that are going to be difficult for you to completely control. Fulfillment center delays. So Asian partners have to deal with tsunamis. They have to deal with flooding and things that we don't often have in the US. Now we do have hurricanes here. In the last year alone, some of the fulfillment partners I've worked with have had all those items and they'll be closed for one to two weeks and there's, you're just straight out of luck. If they're closed, of course, that means every other project not named yours is also delayed and you're just gonna be waiting on that. Same things can happen in the US due to sickness, even in Europe as well. Another thing that can be something, this can be on you is the large order mixes. Probably the worst scenario I've heard about this is one of the Star Realms projects had over 80 SQUs, and SQU is an individual item with a barcode that they chose to fulfill with one of their campaigns. Now, if you're into permutations of combinations of items, if anyone can do math there, how many different possible product order mixes would they have had with 80 different SQUs? It's very large. I don't even want to do the math on it. It's ridiculous. Even when you have six or eight items, your permutations are rather large. So you think about it as, let's just call them products one through 10. They could have ordered all 10. They could have ordered eight of them, but which of the eight did they order? Oh, they only ordered two, but they ordered product two and product 10, or they only ordered product three and six and seven. There are some ways you can get around this. So basically you're probably going to take three to five days for the fulfillment center to batch up all your items. If you've chosen to do this, I would generally say that if anything, if you can do anything, limit your order configurations at the factory level by prepackaging promo packs. Maybe you've got three things you're choosing to generally sell separately. Your factory will do it for pennies on the dollar to put those all together into other boxes. And they don't even have to be rolled up pretty. If your main game box is what you want to look good on the shelves. Now this is a Kickstarter item, so it doesn't have a good game box for the shelf. This one, but we had some metal coins we sold, for example. We didn't do anything fancy on the bag for the metal coins. You can do the same type of concept of, it can be a no frills type of packaging for these promo or special items that will be a separate type of unit that will ship as a special reward. Similar to this is suboptimal shipping configurations. This kind of plays back into a combination of this large order mix and also if you're shipping something like a play mat that's really large with a game, is that if you have not been explicit up front with your fulfillment centers as to what you're going to do, you're going to end up having things waste space along the way. Replacement parts are expensive to ship from fulfillment centers. It's just something to keep in mind. If you fulfill yourself, you can save your costs, but internationally that's tough. Missing customer information is another issue. For example, if they don't have their phone numbers or they're missing their tax numbers to Brazil. I am running out of time, so I'm going to speed through some of these. Fulfillment rate increases. Generally, you would expect fulfillment rates to increase 10% a year on a conservative number, year over year, sometimes 15%. But there are sometimes things get raised on you even if you didn't ask for it to be raised. So this is really frustrating. You often can't control this. Postal worker strikes happened in the past couple of years in Canada multiple times. They did not deliver mail for periods of two weeks at a time. You really can't control that one. Worsening country to country relations. If you ship to countries like Turkey right now, you may have your package held up in customs for four to six weeks while they're looking to see what someone from the U.S. was sending to them. There's other countries you could pick from that list too. That's just one I'm more familiar with. And also the number of small items people throw away when they receive your boxes, they're in there. 
It's really frustrating. So one way you can avoid that is by putting emails and backer updates saying, please check all parts of your box and packaging materials before throwing your box away. Import taxes, so duty, they might be known as import duty taxes, VAT, which is value added tax, GST is the equivalent in Australia. The US unfortunately is going that route as well with games. If people don't pay those, or even if you're waiting to be told you have to pay them, you can have packages held up in customs for as much as one to three weeks. And this can happen at the container level, it can happen at a pallet level, it can happen at a package level. You could also choose to inadvertently pay your fulfillment partner for VAT and then find out according to the UK or the Great Britain Tax Authority that based on your tax status there, you can't deduct the tax they paid on your behalf and you have to pay it again. I've had that experience the hard way. So you want to ask good questions. <clears throat> and there is lots of and lots and lots of misinformation spread online about VAT. The short and long of it is that you owe that on the price that people pay for your game in Europe. Contrary to popular belief, it's the amount that they pay for it, not the factory value. A lot of people will tell you otherwise. It's a sub whole separate topic. But if you make the wrong mistake, and I list a huge thing there, they're starting to prosecute. It hasn't really happened in the board game industry, but the potential risk is rather high if you choose not to pay value added tax properly. There are often times that the government will just shut down in other countries due to filibuster-like things. That's not the same there, but and you can't file your registrations or your regular tax filings, and you might have to pay penalties as a result of that, or you just get delayed to get things done in a timely fashion. A lot of their websites are really confusing, especially if they're in other languages. Good luck calling someone and being able to have them walk through things. The UK or Great Britain, yes, they were good because they speak English, but if you call any other country, you might have hard times. Also, country tax law changes can throw things through the roof, and mostly I put this large dollar amount here because the U.S. is moving towards a 30%, probably 30% board game tax rate at some point. At least it's threatened. Who knows if it happens, but if it does happen, you have to account for that, which is much larger than any typical cost increase you would plan on. And I'm going to run through these quickly. Backers have their end of the bargain too, but they're usually not going to admit that they're wrong. If they change their shipping address last minute, you may have already shipped them their game. What are you supposed to do? Charge them extra to ship them again? Generally, if you're going to be a good business partner, you're probably just going to ship them another game on charge and eat the one you shipped to Bob Smith, who lives at their house now. If they provide their shipping address way after fulfillment, you may no longer have any games of that anymore. So for you to pull one out of a warehouse that's halfway around the globe and mail it to them, what do you do? You might just refund them. If you choose to collect shipping payments post Kickstarter, good luck getting everyone to pay this. It doesn't happen quickly or at all in some cases. So what do you do? You hold up their shipment or you ship it without collecting their shipping payment. Similarly, backer expectations for timely delivery can be really frustrating. And if you promise something and you want to uphold your promise, you might pay more for expedited shipping methods. Or if you have games fulfilling early in one region, you might pay more to have them shipped quickly from another region. Similarly, I had this the other day, a backer refused to pay the tax upon delivery. I was very clear that their shipment to their country, which had very few orders, they would be responsible for taxes, but they balked at it. So what do I do? Have them ship it back to the factory, pay the difference in shipping, and then what? You know, the difference for me to pay to ship it back to the factory was the same as paying the bill, so I'm going to pay the bill for them. Frustrating, but the customer's always right. Frustrating. What are you going to do about it? So we're running out of time here, but a couple of things to keep in mind is that it's a lot of hard work. You can do it yourself or you can pay someone to do it. Your time or your money, maybe both. You want to also communicate with your partners early and often. Probably the biggest mistake people do is they assume based on prior posted rates that someone else posted and don't reach out to the fulfillment center until the games are just about to leave China. Big mistake. You should be talking with them as soon as possible to make sure that you have all the proper facts. You should also prepare for everything to go wrong, and I literally mean everything financially and mentally. And to that note, if you adopt a good perspective, it'll make your life a lot easier. That's where it comes into being a game. It makes yourself a little more sane. In particular, one thing to do when you're paying attention to all your, what you can do on your end is to account for all of the costs of shipping. A lot of people forget about some of these categories. I call that main freight is that your majority of your shipping is going to come from or to probably to the US and that is whatever your price per game is there. And then the rates today that your fulfillment partner posts, that's an orange bucket. But the shipping and handling will increase next year if you're not fulfilling this year. And then you also have to account for an import tax. And then you have to account for the fact if you're shipping something different to the U.S. or from the U.S. to Canada afterwards, there's going to be additional 
freight you have to account for in that right graph. That's what it shows there. And then you also have to account for the fact that you pay Kickstarter fees or processing fees on all the amount you receive for shipping and handling. So if they pay you $10 and you pay 8% of that, that's 80 cents. That's just lost money in processing. Mm -hmm. People overlook that. So a general breakdown there would be something I just did for a client the other day is a one pound game that they charge $20 for when shipping it to the EU versus the US. And I did a couple of changes with the numbers, but if you were to charge $5 shipping to the US, $13 shipping to the EU to cover import tax and shipping, you would make more in the US, but that's just generally kind of a little rundown of what your roll up would be with a couple of partners that I use regularly. And we'll have this PowerPoint available for you to look at later if you'd like. So as early as possible, know the weight and dimensions of your game. Use a service like the Game Crafter or take other games that you own and fill the form factor that you want. This is important as a game designer that you can help make sure that you're knowing the true cost of what it'll be to get your product to your customers. You also want to increase the shipping cost by 10 or 15% for future years. And then playmat shipping options, you can generally send them in a shipping box like I did, its own. I would say do not do that. It's really premium, but it costs you a fortune. Instead, Customers may not like it, but if you want to be sane in your shipping costs and actually make money on the project, you would want to have your playmats be folded in the box. Some people are going to cover their ears, but from a project creator perspective, there's no better way financially to do this unless you want to charge people $20 extra in shipping for their playmat, which they don't want to pay. At a convention, it's one thing, but to ship it to them, it's another. There are ways they can iron and get out those creases. And did I mention you should make a spreadsheet? Other things you should keep up with logistics news. Boring, I know, but if you're going to do the work yourself, you have to pay attention to that. Revisit your spreadsheet. And this is a really great website. You can estimate freight costs, freightos.com. Communicating with partners, we talked about this. It's good to have more than one partner in a region. So if someone goes bankrupt or belly up, it happens sometimes. You have a fail safe. You can also compare rates that way. Keep asking about known changes to rates. Sometimes your partner won't change rates. Sometimes they will. And set expectations of what you will do, uphold your end of the bar bargain so that they want to treat you as a good business partner and bend over backwards for you to help you when they need or you need their help. Treating your partners well goes a long way. I've seen it the other way where I've had fulfillment partners ignore other people for weeks at a time because they were treated poorly, whereas they were responding to my emails daily. This is a shipping box that came to our house that was destroyed in the mail. Thankfully, all the games were fine because we had double bubble wrap on the inside, but it can look alarming. Prepare for everything to go wrong. Add two months of buffer to your project. That is a pretty safe buffer from start to finish. If you just generally thought it was going to get to them in April, plan on it getting to them in June. Add 5 or 10% on top of the projected next year pricing increases to cover yourself. This is true across the board. And be willing to have transparent and timely communication with backers. Even if it makes you look bad, they'll still appreciate the honesty and won't hold it against you as much. Also, being realistic, you will have things go wrong. Don't beat yourself up. It happens to everyone. It's good to share experiences with others. Hopefully, they can avoid making the same mistakes. I've made a lot of mistakes, but thankfully, on future projects, I've avoided making those same mistakes. And I've tried to think of this all as a game because then if it's more of a game, I like games. So if I make logistics a game, it makes it less onerous to go through all the tasks. You're welcome to follow up with me any questions at a later point, even out in the lobby or via email. I think we may have only have just a couple minutes here for questions in the room. A lot of material. Any questions? Yes. So this isn't meant to be a loaded question, uh, but for, <laughs> for a smaller or Yeah, in the U.S., I would use Quartermaster Logistics as the primary partner to work with. They're generally my go-to in the U.S. I'd compare their rates with some other ones from year to year. Another one that's really good to work with is uh, Flat River Group. They're basically the largest game supplier into Amazon. Now, they're fulfillment centers, so sometimes they're going to be more biased in how they present advice to you. And That's right. They have their own business interests. I completely get that. Great question. Two reasons they're really good are they get back to you quickly and both those partners give you set rate sheets. They don't quote, quote you custom for projects. So when your specifications change last minute, you don't have to wait another day or two to get an updated quote from them. Other questions? Yes. When are you making the game for it? Say that again? When are you making the game for this? Oh, yeah, probably not. <laughs> Great question. though. Yes.
Community Fulfillment Center from the Big Panther. It won't tell you the different crates that go in the bonus stickers, packages, the pallets, or the like, won't tell you the first stop. You would generally hope to get the one, and Panda's actually pretty good about managing it. Some factories, though, will send you to the one who sends you to another who sends you to another, which I, you want to avoid. But you hopefully get one partner. OTX is one that Panda likes to work with a lot. We work with Green Worldwide. I highly recommend them. They would manage it from factory to your fulfillment center, and then you take over with the fulfillment center. All right. Yeah, one last question. Uh, I would ship to those countries. I might choose to not ship to Brazil or Russia, though. Yeah, I'll be around in the back, too, if anyone wants to ask questions afterwards. Thank you all.